which is cool enough, but we had a little talk last night, and you really are looking at a couple of superheroes. Um, Samantha is pretty incredible. I had to write this down because the list is so long. Um, when I think she was an undergraduate, you co-invented an artificial in immune system for DARPA, which was uh, further developed into uh, a, a commercial product. Uh, she speaks Russian. Yes? I'm not making it up. Da. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> she's a scuba diver. Um, she designed a 3D printed toilet out of uh, recycled materials. It's uh, in work. It's in work. <laughs> Good enough. Um, what else? Um, she's a certified firefighter at EMT. Um, the list goes on. Um, her current position is uh, a. Tell me again. I'm a social entrepreneur in residence. That's right. And Chris is uh, no slouch himself. He is the deputy director of uh, Napa's Open Innovation Program. Uh, he is not an astronaut, but he is an aquanaut. So he spent 10 days underwater in uh, NOAA's Enterprise Research Station in uh, is that right? Aquarius. Aquarius in, uh, in Florida. Um, he helped with a. Uh, human uh, moon missions and also worked on uh, spacesuit design for the uh, Russian and US space stations. So my god. Um, so today their presentation is called Spacing Out Your Brain and uh, I don't know if anyone saw this, this past summer uh, Make hosted a uh, Google Plus Hangout um, our, uh, our Google um, Maker Camp and uh, this is going to be sort of a, a continuation of, of that uh, conversation and uh, talking about what NASA is doing with hacking and making there I was very uh, intrigued to know that you know hacking and making is very much alive in NASA um, and they are uh, really have an affinity with the maker community here so enough for me take it away guys all right thanks Deb. appreciate that introduction and we are so happy to be here. I, this environment is, it just makes us feel like we're among friends. It's awesome. Um, yeah, so thanks for Dale and, and all of Make for having us today. And I um, just want to start out by nodding to spacing out your brain. So there's also a double meaning to that. When you think about things differently, when you go to space, when you make things to go beyond where we are, that's kind of another way of spacing out your brain. So we're going to help, help you realize how we do that and then I'm gonna ask you to start doing it more because we need your help if we're ever gonna go beyond where we've gone before uh, so as we start first um, has anyone here ever worked for NASA before or worked with NASA at all all right okay. who we got who we got stand up who are you ten seconds Brian McLaughlin, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Hubble, JWST, uh, joint polar satellite system and uh, Aquarius. Nice. Awesome. Uh, hello, McLaughlin. I'm the King Kong. I used to work at the Space Center. I used to work at the Space Center. I used to work at the Space Center. Bunch Hi. of satellites. That's the cape. Clearly yes, a maker. Eric James and I saw the movie Space Camp. Hey! Yes! Hey, high five! Do you have a green laser? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, sir. Steve Murphy, I used to on the NASA Nice. Anyone else? You know they can see green lasers from space. If you point it right <laughs> and you have an automatic pointing system. It's uh it's been proven by Don Pettit in the last expedition. So today we want to demonstrate that intersection between makers and space. Quick introductions. Step thanks for doing it, so I don't have to spend much time on this slide. Um, I like this picture because it kind of overlaps a lot of what I've done, space station, shuttle, and then uh, the ocean below and aquanaut world. Um, Samantha? Sure. So um, thanks to the really glowing and um, introduction by Seth. So like Chris, I have a passion for community and making, which for me often translates into breaking stuff. Um, as a result, I'm the social entrepreneur in residence with Chris, so I have an interest in space and society. Because of that interest, I am involved in Engineers Without Borders Johnson Space Center, which is an extracurricular activity, um, a group of eclectic astronauts and rocket scientists 
and flight controllers participate in to come together because we believe there's an inherent similarity between living and working in space um, and the, the innovations that we come up with as well as the challenges that are faced in the developing world. So because of that, we come together in a creative space that Johnson Space Center has, similar to a tech shop, to build. And right now we're working on a solar fruit dehydrator for pineapple uh, for an orphanage in Rwanda seeking to become financially sustainable. And, and we do that by uh, do-it-yourself projects that adapt the processes and technologies and the insight that we gain from um, supporting the space program. And I just want to point out real quick, without my green laser pointer, uh, Matt here, Matthew Fiedler, and by night, he participates in Engineers Without Borders with us, but by day, he's a real rock star and a core member of the NASA, Neu NASA Neuroscience Lab. And Matt, you may recognize this picture, was the gentleman that was featured in our Google Maker Camp this past summer. So um, the Maker Camp, so we talked about that earlier. That was a really neat event because it showed how um, we're doing things in the lab that you can kind of build up in your garage um, to study really advanced, really advanced questions. So, so this one, um, Matt has, yeah, that's a 3D model of the inner ear, and it shows the three degrees of freedom that, uh, that are affected and that we use to detect how we're, we're balanced. And they make machines, they make, um, they, well, and we'll see a, a short video clip where they, they make, simulators that end up simulating how you're going into space. And why is this important? Well, when you go into space, your body doesn't know what's up and down. So it gets kind of confused. It takes a while to adapt. And uh, when it comes back down, it does the same thing. Well, when's the most important time to have your balance? Probably when you're on the stick ready to land, when you've just come back and seen gravity for the first time in, in six months. So it's really important for that lab to, to figure out how the brain works so we can either counteract or teach the brain to learn how to adapt quickly. Uh, so that's that's what Matt's lab does. And so we'll see a video a bit about it when we get to the present. But I do want to go back to the past and and show how makers have been at NASA since the very beginning. Does anybody know what this is a picture? What this is a picture of? Yes, sir. Jerry right there, filter from Apollo 13. You win a patch. All right. So as Chris put it, it we put this into that. You'll, yeah, so, so you remember the scene, right? He's like, these people have to breathe. The CO2 is building up. We need to make this fit into that using nothing but that. That, my friends, was the first hackathon. <laughs> so, well, it got some attention. Um, there have been books written about it. It's, it's a philosophy that um, caught the attention of some directors, and they decided to make a movie out of it. But you can see this guy here, um, he, had, he had an inclination to make, even as a young child. So, um, so Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. We're starting to learn from that. When you define the problem statements, your hackathons become more effective. And we'll get to that in the future part of it, but that's a lot of the focus of our team at NASA. But hacking just hasn't happened in the past. There's been some recent um, hacks that have garnered a lot of attention, such as the notorious toothbrush hack, where they had a, a large accumulation of dust around a bolt um, that was going to affect the power supply. So they hacked a toothbrush in space, real time, in order to get that cleaned out. Yeah, so these are the type of things where you would, at, on Earth, you'd probably just go to a Home Depot and you know, get a little wire brush and then bring it home and, and clean out the bolt it, it hole so it could go in and, and attach whatever you're attaching so uh, you could change out your power supply that's powering your home off the grid, responsible you. Uh, well, they're off the grid up there and they are making their own power and when they have to change something out, they have to use what's up there or wait for a part to be flown up in six months and maybe longer and depending on how heavy it is, it might cost thousands of dollars. So if they need a brush, uh, they have to make it. And so that's what it looks like. Um, it but we was, don't only hack in times of crisis. Right. And, and so there was, uh, I'll talk about this one because I worked on the spacesuit and taught the astronauts how to actually use it. So this is, this is an astronaut uh, free floating. He is attached with a, a tether on top there, but he kind of looks like he's free floating. When that happened in the shuttle, we could go get him. If someone detached themselves from station and like, oh, oh I can't reach it anymore. Uh, so we could 
fly the shuttle over and go get them. It was an emergency situation, but still we could save them. When the station was born and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, you couldn't fly the whole station to go get one guy. So it was a very dangerous situation. If you, if you miss a, a, a tether clip and, and you float off, we have to be able to save the crew. So what they did was adapted an old MMU, manned maneuvering unit. It was a big, giant backpack that made you fly around. We thought that was the best way to fly around station back then. Uh, we retrofit that technology into a smaller thing that strapped on the edge of the backpack. And you can see over on the sides here, there are some cold gas thrusters. Very lightweight. Uh, the tank was just enough to get you back to the closest part of station if you were spinning at the, the best the worst case speed. And, and that was a hack that was developed in response to a situation, not necessarily a problem. The situation was just simply being in space around a giant spacecraft. So as people thought about these situations more and more, we, we turned back to our maker culture and figured something out. So um, that's a... I like your shirt. <laughs> and new processes and technologies are expanding our opportunities in order to foster our maker culture. And it's becoming more vibrant. We uh, frequently have um, adaptations in DIY projects that involve Xbox Connect, 360, Microsoft platforms. As you see here, we have virtual reality systems that allow us to train our astronauts better, to train them safer, to um, help them um, adapt physiologically to the space environment, and also to learn about life on Earth as we learn how the body moves and interacts with design. So here's one. The previous slide was was a virtual reality lab to train, as, as Samantha mentioned, to train the astronauts to do a spacewalk. Well, that happens on the Earth when they before they go up in space to train them how to do their spacewalk. But when they're up there for six months at a time, uh, they don't have that big virtual reality lab and those great helmets, and it wasn't quite important enough to send up a giant lab in order to just train them for one spacewalk. So. Uh, we had a big problem because they were up there six months and then, oh, we got to train you to do the spacewalk we didn't really plan on you doing when you launched. So um, using a limited amount of hardware that was flown and we could get to the point where there's no, no hardware flown, um, they turned a laptop upside down. It's just floating up there anyway. It can be in any direction it wants to be. And the screen was, uh, was mirror image it, or was, um, was split up in a three-dimensional uh, split screen. And you've seen that. You can put the... YouTube option on if you wanted to see that kind of thing. And we would then train the crew on their translation paths and uh, where the box was. We would have the 3D model and then highlight where it was and they could move around it and just study it before they went out on a very time critical spacewalk. Uh, so they do almost the same kind of training on orbit with an upside down laptop and a, a black screen to block out the light. Uh, so, so these types of things are happening now. Um, go ahead. No, go ahead. I would say, so as as we do operations, we, we have to study things like this in, in a regular way. So there are some infrastructure we've set up. Um, we have a partnership with NOAA to use their Aquarius module. Aquarius is, uh, is an underwater habitat. Uh, I spent some time in it. It was 43 feet below the ocean uh, surface. And they would be saturated when they go down there. So saturated means you have all the nitrogen you need and more. And if you were to come up, you'd have nitrogen bubbles in your blood almost immediately, the bends, we call it. So that's why you have timetables when you go scuba diving. Well, when you're there 24 hours, you're saturated there. You can't get any more nitrogen in. But that also means you have to go through a strict uh, free breathe protocol with, with the oxygen in order to come back up. So what they would do is send astronauts down there in very close quarters. It's short sleeve environment um, because there's air pumps in the whole habitat. But it teaches them how to operate in that very close quarters, also do some spacewalks where they actually walk out on the surface. Uh, that's analogous to if we were out on in the moon or Mars. And they do a lot of space operations the same way we would if we were on the moon or Mars. And so we study concepts, we study tools and techniques. And uh, go to the next slide, I think it we, is. OK. We also, um, we also study tools that we're currently using in the labs here on ground. Um, NASA's been doing a great job of taking advantage of, of media and opportunities to tell our story and show what we're doing and to receive some feedback on um, how some of these tools, such as the power drill you see here, have application to life on Earth. And these labs are prevalent around NASA. Um, it, it's a very distributed 10 different centers. Um, you know, the agency has a lot of different pockets of this type of, of maker innovation. And 
Uh, so if you just search on YouTube, you'll see all sorts of DIY projects, and including Matthew Fiedler, our resident uh, neuroscientist. Now I'm going to bring up this video. And so the maker camp. So so Matthew brought us into, and you can have you can see this entire video on the backyard brains. Yeah, backyard brains was there too. It, it, so it was is NASA and backyard brains. Um, and backyard brains is here today. So look for him, the, the guy with the cockroach with the electrodes and scary stuff. Um, so this is Matt explaining place uh, coming back into the Earth's gravity or leaving it then. Uh, that's a water will, tank. Uh, so Matthew has a background as a farmer. We will use so a motion device like this. Um, that, um, this he's is interacted a motion with over the years. Where on his farm back home. we are exploring. Uh, so he took us into his back. lab. Crew members come back. And they're going to. And we had we had questions from the audience and. Uh, so you see here how how the three degrees the Mars three degrees uh, of freedom for this uh, this now, spacecraft actually driving across the surface of Mars as a person inside controlling it. Dr. Stephen Moore uh, of the so Sinai School of Medicine. Not a huge and budget for that using this to understand technology and not a huge program behind it to push it forward, but it, those are answers that, that need to be uh, answered. How do you how do you control a rover after you just so got to a gravity environment after this long trip of not having any any inner ear um, stimulus at all? Or worse, how do you land a system coming back if you've been um, out of the, an environment with gravity for up to nine months? Simulator uh, across the surface of Mars, and we want to see how your performance is after you come back. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. And, and like I said, this is happening all over the agency. Um, on the largest scale, maybe, with maybe the largest budget, you look at some of our really huge successes, and uh, it's really, really amazing. I, I mean, how many people watched or heard of or saw videos of the Seven Minutes of Terror? Wasn't that freaking cool? I mean, it's unbelievable what you have to do when you start scaling up these projects. These aren't just little things in a bunch of airbags anymore. There, there's an a giant jeep going on the surface of Mars. Uh, it just blows my mind. So I, I put this in, in there because there's a link to actual footage. You, everybody remembers the animation. You can almost make it, make it look like it's real, but then you realize, oh, there wasn't a camera 20 feet above the rover when that was happening. Um, it, so this someone put together with actual footage of the heat shield coming off until it lands. And it's amazing just to see the um, see, see the landscape get closer and closer and closer and realize that this thing is actually landing on Mars. Um, that is an animation. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just amazing to know that we have that sort of technology on, on Mars right now to the future. So what does this look like in the future? And that's what the Open Innovation Program is concentrating on. How do we gather the energy of the maker community within NASA? look at the technology that's helping to connect us all, which has really made the external maker community possible. Uh, if you have a cool enough project, it actually gets made a hundred times and you get iterations that you never had, you never have time to do them yourself. And we all know of examples. Open ROV is one great example. I know they're around somewhere. I don't think they're here right now because they're, they had something else scheduled at the same time, but they're, they're so awesome. Um, they put together their open ROV. It's an underwater vehicle that you can put together with 3D printed parts um, uh, and CNC parts on a tight budget, and then put it underwater. And it's it it roves. It, it you can see a live video feed. And these are the type of technologies that are good platforms. So we brought it to Nemo, and it tooled around. We took data. Um, we, we learned a lot of things because it was first time ever in salt water, it was first time ever with waves and, and current and everything. Uh, so it, they're getting to the point where they can start to think about counteracting those type of things. Um, and so platforms. So open ROV isn't the only technology that can be open sourced right now. There's a lot of potential with CubeSat, which you may have heard of, Stephen in particular, back there. If you want to know more about CubeSat, talk to Stephen, wave, OK? <laughs> Buy parts for your own satellite. Launch it next year. Who doesn't I mean, want to do that? Just talk to Steven. 
So one of the other things, again, focusing on platforms of, of making. Um, this is the sandbox at Johnson Space Center. It is our best interpretation of a makerspace yet, I believe, at NASA. There's, right now, there's so many things that people want to do but don't have the resources within their program because it has to make it through the bureaucracy to get to the top and get important enough to get paid for. But if there were just a little bit of infrastructure paid for automatically and then that employee was willing to put the extra time in to build that prototype or test out that technique, they have a place to go now. So this is at Johnson Space Center, it's called the Sandbox and it's set up just like a makerspace, and we're working on getting that community now talking to each other a little bit more, so they're not just going into the sandbox, doing their project, and then walking out. They're actually interacting and helping each other, which we're learning how to do from all you guys. So this picture was actually taken in Tech Shop San Francisco, where we hosted the International Space Apps Challenge this past April. We're all wearing, we're, we're both wearing our Space Apps shirt. Uh, Katie Jeremko over there is, is going to put hers on soon. She has a rock shirt, Random Hacks of Kindness shirt. It's another platform that we set up to, uh, to engage people. Um, we're partners in Rock. We didn't set that one up ourselves. But uh, Katie works with us in the Open Innovation Program as well. So definitely talk to her afterwards as well. Um, International Space Apps Challenge, we did that last April. Has anyone heard of it? Show of hands. It was the world's there. largest hackathon. At the time. I think there were other ones since then. Uh, I think Rock beat it right afterwards yeah, in June. All seven continents and the International Space Station. So we, we had. Uh, over 20 locations, and they got together and worked on projects that benefited space technology or that ported space technology to applications on Earth, like the Pineapple Project. Such as the Pineapple Project. This is a, a personal interest of mine. We were looking at an app to help um, leverage satellite data from space to help subsistence farmers make informed decisions when using unused land. It was really cool because this was the world's largest hackathon at the time. Uh, so we had participation from people all over in the developing world. In the end, we developed a consortia. Now it's, it's approaching close to 50 participants who are from four different continents, five different countries, and six different cities around the world. So Space Apps Challenge, another example of a platform we're trying to set up. And when you set up a platform, people show up and they build stuff. And they need a low air barrier to entry. They need well thought out problem statements. and uh, and that's kind of what we need your help on. We need you to not only maybe show up to these things, but tell us what's important to you. Tell us what NASA should spend their time porting the, the technology back to Earth for. Um, and then maybe you have some ideas on how, if you just space out your brain a little bit, maybe you could think about these problems that we have in space and, uh, and help us solve them. So we're looking to you as the expert. Let's make it all the space together. Um, our group is focused on that. What, uh, we'd like you to check out our blog at open.nasa.gov, and that kind of tracks what we're monitoring out there and, and things we go out and do, projects we have. The Space Apps Challenge will happen next year. I can say that officially, as long as no crazy budget stuff goes on between now and then. Um, the, it, it happened last April. It's not a set date next year, but we plan on having a second one. We learned so much about how to set up a collaboration platform that, um, that we really want to build on that. Building on it today, though, we can go over to the Zone A pop-up, and we're going to have a discussion. Whiteboarding, Katie, our designer in residence, is going to lead it. And uh, so talk to her now, or catch us all at 5 o'clock. And I we just. Don't, we don't have much time today. We really would like to have a discussion with you guys. So this will be our chance to sit down and really hear your thoughts. Yeah. And, and that's what we're all about. Our team is very small and, and as lean as we can be. And, um, and I wanted to end off with this slide because it kind of incorporates our, our, our philosophy a little bit. We're trying, to, um, we're, we're trying to push the barriers of, of how we do business at NASA while looking outside NASA to see how to do that the best. And um, speaking of open.nasa, we would like to uh, take your picture to put on the blog when we summarize this talk. Because so. there are a lot of great ways to get involved, and we recognize that. So we're going to work our hardest um, tomorrow as we fly home to put together a post that says how you can get plugged in. 
and what we learned from you guys over this past weekend. So please check that out Monday morning and look for yourself. So thank you all and let's all go to space together. <laughs>